In this video, we're gonna talk about my most recent acquisition of a grail for my personal collection, why I chose the book I did, why I paid the price I did, and why I think foreign price variants are the next big trend in comics. Stay tuned. Bryce Comics. First off, we have a monthly giveaway here on the YouTube channel and at the newsletter at BryceComics.com. If you subscribe to the channel, comment on this video and like this video, you're entered to win the first appearance of Beta Ray Bill. And if you sign up for the newsletter at BryceComics.com, you're entered to win the first appearance of Jubilee. Next week, I will announce the winners for those two books and I will reveal what the new giveaway for April will be for the channel. So without further ado, here it is, my latest acquisition for the PC. Bink! Tales to Astonish, number 27 in a CGC 6.0, the first appearance of Hank Pym, the Ant-Man. And this is the UK Pence Price Edition. So this is a book that I have always wanted for my PC. It was actually one of the first grails that, for whatever reason, was one of the first grails that I ever really, really wanted to have in my collection. I think because it is so incredibly rare, and it's just such a cool underdog story for um, the Ant-Man, which we'll get into here in a little bit. And I was bidding on a 7.0 at Comic Link that ended up ending for $16,250, which was way more than I had to spend. And then I found this pen copy, a CGC 6.0 on eBay listed for $9,000. And I went to GPA and saw that a 6.5 pence copy sold in February for $10,250. So I offered $8,000 to the seller. And to my surprise, he actually accepted the offer. And so seeing that this 6.0 I got for $8,000 and there was a 6.5 that sold for $10,250, I felt like it was a great deal and a really comfortable price, um, good entry point for this book. So so at first, though, I was really hesitant to buy a Pence copy because I wasn't too familiar with Pence copies, what they're all about, and the history behind them. So I did a whole bunch of research and talked to a whole bunch of people in the community. And I'd, I'd now like to talk about what I found out in all my research and then get into some more details about this awesome book in Tales of Sonic 27. So in 1959, American comics officially started being distributed in the UK for sale. They are the exact same comics printed on the exact same equipment with the exact same ads printed at the exact same time. The only difference is the price on the cover. So at the end of the print run, usually about the last two to 5% of the print run for Marvel books, they switched the plate that had cents with the plate that had pence. And for DC, they just stamped the books with the UK pence price. Now, these are not reprints. These are price variants. And they're are way more rare than the U.S. sense counterpart. In this hobby, we value rare, as we should. But historically, Pence copies have been considerably cheaper than the Sense copy, and the reason why doesn't seem to be so clear. The main two reasons that I can think of is that people are unaware of exactly what a Pence copy is, and number two, the Pence symbol is unfamiliar to U.S. buyers causing uncertainty. There could be some form of unconscious cultural superiority thing going going on there as well. But all of these things kind of perpetuate each other. And that's why I think the Pence copies have gone undervalued for so long. And here's an interesting comparison, and it's Canadian price variants, or CPV. Canadian price variants were printed in the same way as Pence copies are. Printed at the same time on the same equipment, the only difference is the price on the cover. Canadian price variants were printed in about the same rarity as Pence copies, about 2 to 5% of the print run. And Canadian price variants demand a premium in the market price. They sell for more, as they should, because they are way more rare. So what's different about Canadian price variants and Pence copies? The only thing I can think of is the symbol for Canadian dollars looks the same as the symbol for US dollars. They look familiar. Pence copies look foreign and Canadian price variants look the same. But Canadian price variants are foreign too. It's, I think this is just mostly an unconscious bias and that the Canadian price variants slipped past this unconscious bias because it looks the same as American dollars. In a recent collection I bought, there was an X-Men 101. 
uh, origin and first appearance of the Phoenix, and the seller didn't mention it was a Pence copy. I'm not even sure he knew it was a Pence copy, and I didn't even catch it until I went to list it on the website because they look exactly the same, except for the price. And then I looked up the prices of this book, in pence versus cents and i saw that they were in this case about dead even the last sale of a 9.4 pence copy was october of 2020 so it hardly ever comes up for sale for 876 dollars and the closest sale of a cents copy in the same time frame was 865 dollars so about dead even so then I dug into the numbers a little deeper because I wanted to put info on the website about how rare they were, and I was shocked. There are 171 total Pence copies on the CGC census for X-Men 101, and 6,103 total cents copies on the CGC census. That's about 2%. This Pence copy is in the top nine overall graded copies in the world. Only six 9.4s, while there are 627 9.4s of the sense copies, making this book over 104 times more rare than the sense counterpart. That's like it being a one in 100. I had it listed for months below FMV and not a single bite. Then I was writing this video and crunched all those numbers I just mentioned and I yanked it off the website because it's going to stay in the PC and on that wall, at least for the time being, because I love rare. And this thing is a true gem. Not to mention it's been across the sea, sold in the UK, made it back to the US and into my collection. I mean, this thing has history. So let's quickly look at some more numbers to show the rarity of Pence editions. Tales to Astonish 27, Sense version has 1,159 total graded copies on the CGC census. Just an absolute ghost. Only 1,100 total copies of all of the blue chip keys. That is, is the lowest number of total copies. And there's only 23 total Pence copies on the census. This copy being in the top eight total copies in the world. 23 compared to 1,159 means that less than 2% of the total copies in existence are Pence copies. Journey into Mystery 83 has 2,185 total copies on the CGC census for cents compared to 32 total copies in pence. That means that less than 2% of the total copies of Journey into Mystery 83 are pence copies. And these numbers hold true for all pence copies in this era, 1 to 5%, usually closer to the 2% mark. Now I wanna jump into some sales data for Pence copies so we can see how they have performed over time because what I'm seeing is that for many, many years, Pence copies sold for much less than the cents counterpart and recently that is starting to change. In some cases, prices are directly in line with one another and the trend seems to already be on its way. So Tales to Astonish 27, a CGC 5.0 Pence copy sold in January of 2014 for 2,150 and the the closest sale for a cents copy was May of 2014 for 3250. So the pence was about 30% less in that case. Journey into Mystery 83 in 2003, a CGC 5.0 pence copy sold for $646. And in the same month, same year, a cents copy sold for $966. So also about 30% less. By the way, a 5.0 Journey into Mystery just sold for $18,000 plus a 15% buyer's commission. So that $900 sale was one one hell of a purchase. This was the trend for the longest time. Pence copies were about 30 to 50% less than cents copies, even though there are only about 2% of the available copies. In today's market, we are starting to see this gap close. In many cases, the numbers line up directly and pence demands about the same as cents. But also in many cases, there is still this drastic price difference. One thing that's interesting is more people are starting to list the their pence copies as more rare as they should. They are way more rare, and in my opinion, the price should reflect that. Let's quickly look at one more comparison for price variance, and that's newsstand editions. Newsstand editions are very similar to foreign price variants in that they are printed at the exact same time on the exact same equipment. The only difference is the barcode and sometimes the price for newsstand copies. For a long time, newsstands went under the radar. Not everyone bought into the idea of them being more valuable, but as knowledge spread about their rarity, they absolutely exploded in price as they should because in this hobby, we value condition and rarity and newsstands are more rare and harder to find in high grade. Foreign price variants are no different. 
in this hobby, as a community, we have established with our wallets in the sales data that price variants that are more rare, like newsstands and Canadian price variants that make up about 2% of available copies should and do demand a premium. We've already established that more rare price variants demand a premium. So why not Pence copies? I think as awareness continues to grow for price variants, the trend could flip-flop just like it did with newsstands. We could be on the beginning stages. So now might be a really great time to get in on Pence copies. And look, I'm not trying to pump this up to make a profit. Both of these books that I have are in my personal collection. I'm not looking to part with these. I'm pumping it up because I think it's actually worthy of it. I pumped up newsstand editions and I will continue to do so because I think newsstands actually should demand a premium. Because trends like this, like with the newsstand phenomenon, they they don't stick unless they're valid. And the newsstand trend is sticking and getting more important to collectors because it is a valid phenomenon. And I think foreign price variants are pretty much the same thing. So let's talk about Tales of Sonic 27 and why I picked this grail. Well, first of all, I firmly believe in the strength of this market, especially blue chip keys. So whenever I have the opportunity to pull the trigger on a big boy book like this, I'm going to do it. I felt like this was the last blue chip key that was still in the undervalued range. Range. So I prioritized it as the next grail that I wanted to get. And one thing that adds to the cool factor of this key, in my opinion, is the history of this series and Tales to Astonish and the original story for Ant-Man. The early issues for series like Tales to Astonish, Journey into Mystery, and Tales of Suspense were like a testing ground for Marvel to test out new characters. Tales of Suspense 31, we saw a prototype for Doctor Doom. Journey into Mystery 73, was a prototype for Spider-Man. Journey into Mystery 78 was a prototype for Doctor Strange. And then Tales to Astonish 27 was supposed to be just a standalone tale, a single issue about the astonishing tale of the Ant-Man. Many of those early issue astonishing tales were just one-offs. Marvel trying new things and seeing what sticks. So when fans responded really well to Hank Pym the Ant-Man, they brought him back in Tales to Astonish 35 and the rest is history. What's absolutely astonishing to me, no pun intended, is how much of that original story in the half-thought-out one-shot of Hank Pym the Ant-Man in Tales to Astonish 27 actually stuck around in his story to the point where we're seeing it played out on screen almost 60 years later with millions and millions of dollars of production value behind it, and it actually works. I mean, that truly is astonishing. So let's take a little guided tour through the nine-page story of Hank Pym the Ant-Man from Tales to Astonish 27. And I'm not going to read every single word. If you want, you can pause it and actually read every single word. All right, so here we go. Tales to Astonish 27, The Man in the Ant Hill. Here's the, sp the splash page, The Man in the Ant Hill. And it starts off right off the bat. We've got Hank Pym, and it says, It works. I've done it. So right off the bat, out the gate, he has created the reduction serum. And he tested it out on this little chair here, and it actually shrunk. And then he pours his growth serum on it and it returns to normal size. So here he goes in front of his colleagues, the other scientists, and they, they're mocking him. And he says, you just wait, I have a new invention. And he's all motivated now to make it work. So he goes back to his lab and he spends countless hours planning and, and he'll show them. And then here's what I think is so funny. They said, uh, Stan Lee says, anything could be reduced in size and shipped for a fraction of the cost. I mean, I just think that's so funny that Stan Lee was thinking about how this could be used was to save on shipping costs all the way back in the early 60s. And also you could fit an entire army onto one airplane. Finally, he says, the last thing I need to do is try it on myself. He pours his shrinking serum. He shrinks down to the size of an ant. And um, it's worked a little bit better than he expected. Now he's the size of the ant. He goes outside. He's finds ants and this part's really interesting because the ants are not his friend right and so you see early on them playing with the dynamics of how is he going to relate to the ants when he's in um, the size of an ant so he falls down into um, an ant hill and he lands inside some honey there's a bunch of honey in the ant hill and he's stuck in the honey and then uh, an ant sees him, crawls towards him, and actually helps him out of the honey. So 
um, you can see they're playing with the dynamics of are they friend or foe. Um, then he comes into contact with the rest of the anthill and he has to fight them off. Um, he succeeds, he gets out of the anthill, and there he sees up on the windowsill the growth serum, but he has no idea. He's surely doomed. He can't run anymore. And then the friendly ant comes to his rescue and saves him. I like to think that this is the first appearance of Antony, you know, retconned from, from the movie. He gets into the growth serum there, grows back to regular size. It totally works. He's back to a normal human. And then the first thing he must do is destroy these growth potions. They're far too dangerous to ever be used by any human again. And so he goes back to his colleagues and they're like, so your experiments failed. And he's like, yep, they totally failed. Didn't work. You guys were right. And that, and so our tale is ended. The end. They ended it right there. Stan Lee ended it right there. He had no faith in this character. He thought, surely people aren't going to like this. This is a standalone tale, the end. But little did he know that that short nine-page story that he had no faith in would become the basis for one of the most popular characters and the source material for thousands of, of future comic books, two going on three feature-length MCU films, and millions of fans across the globe. Here's a quote from Stan Lee from the back cover of Venom Lethal Protector, the gold edition. From Stan, it says, you know, creating a cult favorite is as unpredictable as trying to guess where Wolverine will guest star next. He had no idea Ant-Man would become what it did. It's just a great underdog story that totally adds to the cool factor for this book and this character. So there you have it, guys. That's why I bought this copy and why I think Pence copies in general are severely undervalued. I'm really curious to know what you think. Why have Pence copies historically gone for less or equal to Sense copies? Is this your first time hearing about Pence copies? And if so, what is your honest reaction? If you are turned off by the idea of a Pence copy, why? Dig a little deeper into why. Is it because it's just unfamiliar? Is there a little cultural superiority bias thing unconsciously going on there? I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like and comment on this video, and you're entered to win the first appearance of Beta Ray Bill, and sign up for the newsletter at BryceComics.com, and you're entered to win the first appearance of Jubilee, and every single month there's a new giveaway. As always, thank you so much for sticking with me to the end of the video. Thank you for celebrating with me in this amazing hobby and, and being able to um, you know, acquire these incredible pieces of history. I feel like you guys are right here with me on this journey together and I couldn't be more grateful. So thank you so much and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye. Bryce Comics.